Welcome to Navara Live. I'm Richard Hames, and if you don't recognize me, that's because this is my Navara Live debut. I'm part of Navara's audio section, spending my time working on our podcasts. So if you haven't already, go to the description box below and click on the link to our podcast feeds. There's lots on there, Navara FM, ACFM. We even have a series called Pro Revolution Soccer about the politics of football during the World Cup. So again, all of that in the description box below. But tonight, I'm happy to say that I'm joined by Ash Saka. Hello, Ash. Who are you and what have you done with Michael Walker? Is oh, he God. safe? Uh, Do we have a proof oh, of no. life? <laughs> My plan has been foiled. I am parachuted in from the audio department to uh, persuade everyone to uh, you know, uh, subscribe to our feed as well as the uh, Navara live podcast feed, of course. So coming up tonight on our show, we will be discussing artificial intelligence. More warnings have arrived on the developing technology and Rishi Sunak has waded in too. A story about the DWP that is pretty concerning in regards to disability benefits. And a Tory think tank have come up with some exciting new ways to appeal to millennials. So stay tuned for that. Train drivers across 16 operators are out on strike today. That's after their union, Aslef, rejected a pay offer of 4% a year for two years. The drivers will be out on strike on Saturday too, shutting down many train services across the country. And on Thursday, drivers on some networks will refuse to do extra overtime. That's the unscheduled extra work the drivers do to keep Britain's trains running. Aslev General Secretary Mick Whelan appeared on Good Morning Britain, where Ed Balls asked him about the government's negotiating tactics. In the case of the railways, the delivery group, the government, Mr Harper, they don't seem at the moment to be um, beating your door down to give another offer to get into more talks. They're not talking about it publicly a great deal. What do you think is going on? Do you think that they are um, just not being competent or have they decided that the longer this goes on, the harder it's going to be for you to sustain public support? I haven't seen Mr Harper since before Christmas. I've only met him once, a meet and greet. And I've only seen the rail minister once this year on January the 6th. Um, but the people we've been dealing with, we sat down in good faith, we told them what the red lines were, and they deliberately put it into the deal to make it fail. My view is at this moment they don't want a resolution. Why is that me? I really don't know what their end game is. Uh, we don't want to be on strike. The people behind me on the picket line don't want to be losing money. Um, we just want to get back to doing our day job. But I want to go back to complaining to the about the lack of investment. Yeah, I mean, what's it going to take to resolve this? Because at the well, moment, the, the fear is, the it's, it's is killing off... It gives us a pay deal. It's killing off uh, the train service because when people are thinking, oh, they're not going to rely on the trains because they fear that they'll be disrupted, that, that it'll end up that people don't want to use trains. And that's unfortunate, but we need to rebuild that base. But in between the strike days, we have seen the footfall come back and some companies are running at 100% or more of passenger foot levels than they had before the pandemic. So the railway is going in the right direction. And that's despite the government cutting timetables in some areas to 70%. So your strategy is basically to maintain, to step up action over the summer, to try and force round the table um, people who at the moment you think don't want to do a deal. Well, it's quite clear they don't want to do a deal. I've been, you know, uh, doing this for an awful long time, and I've been in many, many negotiations. And the fact that we managed to do 14 pay deals in the last 12 months elsewhere tells me about the willingness of other people to do a deal. It's extraordinary. Aslev says exactly what its red lines are, and then when they finally do get a deal, they find out that they're all in there. On Friday, the RMT is on strike, with 20,000 onboard crew walking out. And that's expected to cause a lot of disruption on the railways though some trains are likely to run on many services. That combination of Aslev strikes on Saturday and RMT strikes on Friday has led some to accuse the unions of colluding to maximise disruption. This was what Secretary of State for Transport Mark Harper had to say. By targeting much-loved sporting events like the Cup Final and Derby, rail union leaders have consp conspired to inflict as much misery as possible on passengers this week. Here's what the government has done to try and avoid this strike action. While Labour may suggest otherwise, the government has done our bit to try and end these disputes by meeting union leaders, listening to them, 
facilitating fair and reasonable offers, which RMT members working for Network Rail overwhelmingly voted to accept and are no longer striking. On Saturday, it's the Epsom Derby. And it's also the date of the FA Cup final between Man City and Man U. That's being held in Wembley, meaning a lot of people will be wanting to get into London for it. Ed Balls asked Whelan about what this would mean for popular support for the striking workers. Surely sustaining public support at this stage of a strike is so important. The nurses have managed to sustain majority public support. Isn't it risky for you to decide to choose this particular weekend and that particular day, cup final day, when it's two Manchester teams? Or are you not worrying so much about public opinion? We have fast public support, and as you know, there is mass um, strike action, both in the private and the public sector, everywhere at this moment in time, whether it be teachers, civil servants, NHS or elsewhere. And we still retain that support. I don't think there's a family in the country currently that's not impacted by some sort of strike action. Sorry, sorry, We're not deliberately but... targeting certain events. But when but you we... talk about public support, I just want to bring to your attention the latest figures, because we've got this uh, poll by Ipsos of the British public on the rail strikes, and it's supported by only one in three, 32%. That's the last figures that we've got. That's a 7% decline from February. So I, I'm not sure you can claim that as fast public support, can you? It's declining. Well, normally... Normally, when we have any form of public transport um, strike action or disruption, we have less than 5%, so we still have public support. The reality for us is that we don't want to be here. This is a Westminster problem. We don't have problems in Scotland or Wales or in freight or open access or in TfL or elsewhere. We have a problem with Westminster. Over on Talk TV, Julia Hartley Brewer was keen to talk to travel writer Simon Calder about the disruption as well. Strikes used to be on weekdays because you know the, 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 the railways were used by an awful lot of, let's face it, quite influential people, the middle classes who edit newspapers and write to newspapers and bother their MPs. And, and, and they, you have the strike on a weekday, it affects a lot of people. People complained about it and the government felt they had to act. Now all those people work from home on their little laptops with their chai lattes in the garden, so they don't, they're not really affected by it. So what the unions have realised in the last year is you actually have to you know, hit the stuff that you know most people are doing at weekends that's you know you, that's when you get the biggest impact and that's what they're doing yes and uh, talking to mick whelan the general secretary of the aslef trade union um he says absolutely we didn't target deliberately the fa cup Rubbish. final or or um, the epsom derby he just says we're going for saturday because that's the big travel day and they obviously want to cause as much disruption. And also, he tells me that they're very, very um, committed to carrying on right through the summer, if need be. Bear in mind, these are the first national strikes since the 1980s, and they've been going on for almost a year. I calculate up until today, as they have been out 10 times, uh, the RMT union 24 times. Yeah. And uh, of course, the government says we've offered a perfectly reasonable pay deal Railway finances have collapsed since COVID yep. and you're not getting any more. And the unions say, we jolly well are. Yeah, you indeed, wait. holding the rest of the country to ransom. That's right, Julia. Workers should only ever strike at two in the morning on Christmas Day. On GB News, Liam Hannigan didn't even understand what the rail striking is about. Let's just remind viewers that this strike is about pay. They may be confused that back in March, the RMT settled the strike action. Yes, but that was for signalling and maintenance staff. Rail, yeah. That's yeah. signalling and maintenance yeah. staff. The RMT, of course, still has lots of drivers, and indeed ASLEF is a driver's union. Yeah. ASLEF are striking today. RMT are striking on Friday. ASLEF are striking again on Saturday. Yeah. We often often hear claims that aren't trained drivers already quite well paid. And so I put the numbers up on a graphic here I think it's worth looking at. The average pay in 2021 for a trained driver in the UK was £59,189. Across the rail sector as a whole, if you include other workers, it's 43747 A nurse, on average, earns 31000 and 93, which is roughly the average wage across the whole economy. And a senior care worker earns £20,105. So rail unions say rightly they haven't had a pay rise for quite a long time. That's true. Yeah, as they're saying, four years. That's right. But they are already pretty well paid. In fact, since 2011, train drivers' wages have gone up by 39%. Of course, what Hannigan meant to point out, but just 
I don't know, forgot, is that if that 39% claim is accurate, it's a nominal and not a real terms increase. When it comes to pay, that's what the rail workers are fighting for, real terms pay rises that reflect the actual cost of living. But what these right-wingers never seem to be able to understand is that strikes aren't just about pay. They're also about job security and passenger safety. Workers are actually giving up pay in order to fight the government, to keep their colleagues in jobs and their passengers safe. Ash, is there any clearer indication that the right-wing press just doesn't really understand what strikes are for than that they believe they should only be done when they're completely ineffective? I've got to disagree with you just a little bit, Richard, because I think the right-wing press understands strikes very, very well. And that's why they are ideologically committed to misrepresenting the nature of trade union organizing and the withdrawal of labor. It is because they side with capital and not with the workers. Now, the reason why people withdraw their labor is because it is a way of exerting your leverage. If you are an individual worker, you're not in a position of policymaking or determining pay grades or being able to protect jobs and cut uh, costs elsewhere, then the only thing that you've got is being able to organize with your fellow rank and file members to stop working, to cause forms of disruption to the industry that you're working in. That is the one bargaining chip that workers have. They literally don't have any other. It is all about the withdrawal of labor. One of the reasons why rail workers in particular don't have the kinds of bargaining chips that you see in other countries. So an oft quoted example is that in Japan, you often have unions calling what's called a revenue strike. So when it comes to train journeys, the ticket barriers are left open so that people can travel free of charge is because that's something which has been made illegal in this country. We've got some of the most restrictive anti-trade union legislation in this country of comparable nations. It makes it really difficult to do anything other than withdraw your labor. And even that is within really curtailed circumstances. So you need to not only win the ballot of your members, but you need above a certain number of your members to participate. You also are highly restricted in uh, secondary pickets, in moving pickets, in coordinating with other trade unions as well. And so The fact that these waves of strike action have been seen not just across the public sector, but the the private sector as well, is really worrying to a right wing media that had successfully for decades demonized trade unions so that people refer to them and, of course, not the newspaper's billionaire billionaire owners as barons. You know, they'd been quite successfully stigmatized as being the enemy within. That's a legacy of Thatcher era discourses. And now you're seeing, you know, this, um, I think, an emergent and really quite meaningful radicalization of the public in terms of class consciousness. People can feel that their pay is is worth less than it used to be. People can see that all around them, the quality of public services is declining. And they can also see that these corporations are extracting billions of pounds in profit, in shareholder dividends, uh, and, you know, taking it off to other countries. You know, many of these train lines, which are operated by Aslef and RMT members, are owned in part or in whole by companies which aren't even from the UK. That is a huge extraction of wealth. Um, And that's why the right wing papers, I think, are so determined to try and drive a wedge between the public and unions. Now, of course, this is a false dichotomy. You have members of the public who are also members of trade unions. And of course, there is arguments to be made that in striking to improve uh, pay, job security, um, and the quality of the the train service, that's something that's being done in the public interest. That's a line that's been adopted by the Royal College of Nursing and Junior Doctors Unions as well, that they're striking to preserve the NHS, not to bring it to its knees. But this is a a deliberate misrepresentation and a deliberate erasure by the likes of Julia Hartley Brewer, um, because the job of a right wing pundit is that if you are not stupid, pretend to be in the hope that your listening audience will follow suit. 
the uh, layers of deception on here are, are really kind of important to to unpick. Of course, they understand exactly what the function of, of strikes are, and they are against them. I mean, that is their that is their politics. Um, what are the kind of the really instructive things I think to uh, look at when we're thinking about these kind of summer of strikes that's coming up, summer of strikes too, is maybe to kind of look across the English Channel into France, where of course they have much less restrictive union laws. But one of the kind of interesting things that's been happening there is um, a, the coordination between the Yellow Vest movement, this kind of uh, slightly chaotic anarchic movement, 2018, it started, and the more official union structures. And I think there's a kind of perhaps like interesting kind of set of convergences there where um, the one is supporting the other um, throughout. Of course, uh, I am mostly here, as I mentioned earlier, in order to advertise Navarra's podcast. So I'll tell you, we did a podcast on that quite recently. For people with disabilities, or long-term health issues, personal independence payments are often a vital component of government financial support. But it's getting increasingly difficult to access those funds. Recipients are subject to sometimes degrading reviews, having to fill out lengthy forms going into personal details. That's similar to the process of applying for benefits in the first place. But now the big issue has revealed that private companies hired by the Department for Work and Pensions, the DWP, are making it even harder for the people who need it to access that money. According to the latest figures from the DWP, nearly 90% of appeals about initial applications for PIP are being rejected out of hand. So here's how the process works. An applicant can apply to the DWP to access PIP. That application is then assessed by DWP assessors who are in fact employed by the government's favorite private outsourcers, Capita and Atos, if the application is rejected, the applicant can ask for what's called a mandatory reconsideration. And this is why the new figures are so shocking. That's because in 2021, 40% of mandatory reconsiderations resulted in a positive outcome for the applicant. Now it's just 11%. And that's not the end of it. Because when a mandatory reconsideration decides to stick with the initial rejection, the applicant has the right to take the case to a tribunal. But many applicants who go through mandatory reconsideration are too exhausted by the process to pursue the DWP any further. That's a huge problem, because when they get to court, applicants whose applications were initially rejected have that decision overturned around 80% of the time. In many cases, the DWP buckles and changes its mind before the case reaches a court. So the harder the government makes the mandatory reconsideration process, and the more cases it turns down, the fewer the number of applicants who will take the DWP to a tribunal. Z2K is an anti-poverty charity that helps people with PIP applications. Its chief executive said this. These figures demonstrate, yet again, that mandatory reconsideration is simply an obstacle to seriously ill and disabled people receiving support for the extra costs they face. No one should be forced to go through a lengthy, and stressful appeals process to get what they're legally entitled to. Government must fix the broken system it's created and stop denying people their rights. The big issue spoke to one PIP applicant who has multiple diagnosed conditions, including autism, epilepsy, hypothyroidism, and migraines. Despite all of that, she scored zero, zero on her application. This is what she had to say about the experience. They said, I'd have the conditions for 20 years and clearly coped, so why was I applying now? They missed the bit where I made it abundantly clear my husband had just left me and all informal support was gone. I had to become a single parent and had to deal with all the crap myself. They asked me if I had a fidget toy. I said I had one in my handbag I'd been given at some conference or other. The final report said I had a stress ball, so it proved I could cope. That applicant withdrew from the process due to stress. This seems like a pretty big story to me, but I'll tell you something odd. This morning, Work and Pensions Minister Mel Stride was doing the morning news rounds, and not a single journalist asked him a question about it. Ash, uh, the Conservatives have been attacking disabled people for over a decade now. Is the cruelty the point? I'm afraid to say that the cruelty is absolutely the point when it comes to conservative policymaking in the arena of yeah. welfare and in particular, the kind of support which is needed for people who have long term illnesses, illnesses or disability. And I think that the way in which disabled people have been treated abominably 
essentially because they are collateral damage in wider efforts to discipline the workforce shows you just how much bad policy, how much expensive policy, how much cruel policy can be built on a foundation of absolute horseshit. And I think that you've got to understand why disabled people and in particular uh, personal independence payments are in the frame here. It's because you have had not just for the last decade, but I would say decades, particularly since the 1980s of the government and the tabloid press and the right wing billionaire newspaper press barons who have been united in trying to to slash the government's welfare responsibilities. And one way in which they've done that is by demonizing welfare recipients and by casting them as lazy, feckless, and not to be trusted. And this is something which has taken years to achieve, but its impact on public perceptions has been nothing less than transformative. So in 2012, which is really the height of, you know, the Cameron Osborne austerity slash and burn era of economic policy making, you had 37% of Brits responding to uh, uh, surveys about their social attitudes saying that they thought that the majority of people on the dole, as it was called, were fiddling, that they didn't have any right to be receiving government support, that they were essentially lying. And when you think about all the different kinds of, of, of pop cultural and newspaper scaffolding that go into supporting that point of view, you might think of all of those tabloid scare stories about you know, single mom on benefits with 67 children, you know, and driving a Range Rover. Um, you might think about even some sketches in Little Britain where you've got someone in a wheelchair who's obviously lying because they want sympathy and they want ill-gotten gains based on the hard work of other people. And what that added up to, I think, was this really pervasive view that disabled people, people with long-term illnesses, just don't want to work. They simply don't want to work. They make up a cohort of people who you might refer to as the lifestyle unemployed. They just don't want to work. Now, what every serious bit of research shows you is that this idea of there being a stubborn cohort of the lifestyle unemployed is really, really, really tiny. Where you've seen uh, increases in rates of unemployment, it often has to do with macroeconomic policy. So things like deindustrialization, um, things like uh, you know using unemployment in order to you know drive down inflation, which was a preferred tactic of Margaret Thatcher. Or you've got really entrenched problems, which are often to do with mental health and physical health, which put you right back in that category of, you know, people who need help, people who need an awful lot of support. But unfortunately, you don't have policy being made on the facts. The facts being that most people want to be supported into some form of economic activity. People want purpose and meaning in their lives. And for those who are unable to participate in employment in that kind of way, well, that's not because they want to. It's not because they just think, oh, well, sit on the sofa all day. That's what I want. It's almost, you know, 99 times out of 100 because they really need support. And that's why we're supposed to have a welfare state in the first place. That should be the basis of policymaking, but it's not. And that's why you end up, I think, with these really humiliating and undignified and cruel tests of character, which also result in delays of payments, which, you know, materially impact disabled people's lives. You have this happening because the basis for the policy making isn't, okay, what's the reality of unemployment for people in this country? The basis of policy making is that sketch from Little Britain in which the guy in the wheelchair was lying. The uh, interaction here between sort of popular culture and policy is really peculiar. I think you've teased out some of the really like uh, just obscene things that have happened in British culture over the last 15 years. AI is everywhere at the moment. You can't move for tweet threads telling you you're falling behind if you're not using 10 different machine learning tools on the daily. Maybe that's just me. 
We spoke on this show about a month ago about the so-called godfather of machine learning, Jeffrey Hinton, warning that computer systems might soon be smarter than humans. But it's astonishing the pace at which the field is developing. The worries about deepfakes, fake images that look very realistic, have been joined by fears about autonomous agents, computer programs that carry out tasks online entirely without human input. Two months ago, GPT-4 was used to produce AutoGPT, an autonomous agent that could be set very broad tasks like make me money, and then work out what to do without any further input. And then last week came Voyager, an AI that can teach itself to play Minecraft. Okay, you might think it's a game for children. But Voyager can decide for itself which new skills it should learn and then code itself to learn them. And then, again using GPT-4, it can check its own code and improve it. Okay, that's all in Minecraft, but when you take those same basic technologies and turn them loose on the internet, you've got something a little more scary. All this rapid advancement has culminated in a warning from the Center for AI Safety. Their new statement is a single sentence in length and signed by some of the world's top AI experts, including Jeffrey Hinton, who left Google over the risks. And it's hardly a moderate statement. In fact, it's probably the most starkly written thing we've seen from the mainstream of the AI community. The statement said this, mitigating the risk of extinction from AI should be a global priority alongside other societal scale risks, such as pandemics and nuclear war a global priority equivalent in scale to pandemics or nuclear war. So if we don't slow down progress, what are we facing? One signatory of the statement is Ilyazy Yudkowsky, an expert on decision theory who has spent the best part of a decade promoting the study of AI risk. According to him, the risk is doom, total annihilation. I think that we are hearing the last winds start to blow, the fabric of reality start to fray, this thing alone cannot end the world, um, but I think that probably some of the vast quantities of money being blindly piled in, blindly and helplessly piled into here are going to end up actually accomplishing something. What Yukowski means by accomplishing something there is accidentally making something very bad news for humanity indeed. Another signatory is Sam Altman, the head of OpenAI, the company that made GPT-4. As someone who's been involved in creating some of the most powerful pieces of technology ever devised, Altman is a serious person to consider. You might expect him to be dampening fears, but in January, he said this. The bad case, and I think this is like important to say, is like lights out for all of us. Um, I'm more worried about like an accidental misuse case in the short term where you know someone gets a super powerful, like it's not like the AI wakes up and decides to be evil. And I think all of the sort of traditional AI safety thinkers reveal a lot about more than, about themselves than they mean to when they talk about what they think the AGI is going to be like. But but I can see the accidental misuse case clearly, and that's that's super bad. To respond to the risk, Ullman has called for the creation of an equivalent to the International Atomic Energy Agency that regulates nuclear power. So how might an AI start to get out of hand? Andrew Briggs is a professor of nanomaterials at Oxford, and another signatory of the statement. He spelled out the process on Sky News. The day might come when their um, capacity vastly exceeds that of humans, and humans lose the ability to stay in control of what it is that the, human, uh, that the machine is, is um, seeking to optimize. And at the time, it seemed in the far future. Now, it, 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 it may be, as it were, galloping towards us. But Pedro Domingos, a professor of computer science as well, says everyone really needs to calm down. The worry that people have is that AI will get too intelligent and we will not be able to control it. But intelligence and control are completely different things. We can have an infinitely intelligent AI that we still control very well. So there's some dissenting opinion, but the list of signatories to this new statement is about as prestigious as it gets in the world of AI. So the sensible moderate voices on AI risk are now saying things that sound a lot like the more radical voices a few years back. This all might seem a little familiar. 
Doesn't AI risk seem quite similar in some ways to the dire warnings we get so regularly on climate change? Ash, I want to come to you. Why does capitalism seem to have so many of these runaway problems like climate change and AI risk, or even the pandemic, that it just can't get a handle on? And why is it so hard for voices that are sounding the alarm early on to get governments to act? I think the first thing you've got to understand is that capitalism only has one incentive. That is the accumulation of profit, no matter what the other considerations may be. And we see that in almost every sphere of public life, that the uh, accumulation of profit and the extraction of profit doesn't necessarily produce efficient results, doesn't necessarily produce the best results for ensuring the public good, and it certainly doesn't produce the most sustainable results, but that are the but it's the results that though that set of um, incentives produces. We see that in terms of fossil fuel extraction and consumption. We see that in terms of its impact on climate change. We see that in terms of things like uh, the privatization of key utilities, that the profit incentive is really, really bad at protecting or entrenching or expanding the public good. And that is particularly I think, worrying when you've got an ever accelerating tendency towards flooding emergent areas of technology, new avenues for commodification, new ways of extracting profit. And you've got ever more frictionless ways of just sinking money into it in order to speed up technological advancement. I think it's something that we've seen with social media. I don't think anyone would say that the development of social media has been without its negative consequences as well. If you just want to look at my own mental health. Um, We've seen that with social media in that money comes in. It develops this technology at a pace which far outstrips our social ability to understand what's being done to us, the political ability to get a grip on it, and also maybe a cultural understanding or even some form of discussion about, is this good for us? Is this something that we really want? Is this different from how we would want it? How would we want to do this thing? We've never had an opportunity to do that with social media, and we're certainly not getting it when it comes to AI. Um, When it comes to AI and what Sam Altman terms as, you know, the lights out scenario. I don't feel like I've got the uh, literacy to make an assessment about how likely that is. And what's worrying is that the people who are in charge of our regulatory institutions don't have the literacy to decide that either. Now, while people like me and you, Richard, we've got an incentive to try and look at this from the most risk averse position possible, because that's our job it's to scrutinize what corporations are doing and how governments react to it. Governments have a different set of incentives. One, they don't like to do things that sound expensive, take up a lot of time, don't have an immediate electoral benefit. Uh, governments don't like to do things which involve learning and reacting to new information. We saw that in terms of Jeremy Hunt's responses to Operation Cygnus, which was a uh, essentially a war game for the NHS, which modelled what might happen should there be a highly infectious respiratory illness. The decision that Jeremy Hunt and other ministers made was, we'll just ignore it. Now, lots of the findings of Operation Cygnus, the key weaknesses and vulnerabilities of the NHS, indeed came to pass when it came to the pandemic. And that's because at the time, uh, you know, in the in the early to mid 2010s, there wasn't a political incentive to get ahead of the curve. There was only a political incentive when it was already too late. So I think what the development of AI really sheds light on are these, you know, potentially fatal weaknesses in our political system, uh, how the incentives line up to only do things when it's too late, and even then often by half measures. And you can't afford to do that with something as potentially dangerous as AI. And even if the lights out doomsday scenario is something which is totally unlikely to happen, merely the stuff of science fiction, what we know about AI is that it's going to have and is already having huge impacts on the labor market. We're already seeing 
sector-wide layoffs in the tech industry. And part of that is to do with uh, post-pandemic spending. Part of that is to do with interest rates. But a lot of that is going to be to do with the direction that artificial intelligence is taking. It's going to mean an awful lot of people working in tech are out of a job. And that's going to be mimicked across lots of other sectors of the labor market as well. So if you do a, you know, white collar job like data entry, or maybe you do auditing, maybe you do accountancy, maybe you do paralegal services. These are all areas which look like they're going to be totally transformed, turned upside down by artificial intelligence. Now, policymaking is one step behind that because our government is still saying, go to uni and get a computer science degree, learn to code, you know, train essentially for sectors of the economy, which are most at risk of job insecurity and mass redundancies because of the development of AI. Um, So we don't even have an education response to the challenges posed by AI, let alone a taxation response to what happens when you've got the ability of corporations to become ultra wealthy without having to lose very much in the way of wages. Um, So I think we're way behind when it comes to talking about AI. I mean, Jeremy Hunt, just to talk about um, someone who is never in danger of learning from a mistake. Just a couple of months ago, I was asked about AI and if it kept him up at night. And he was just like, nah, not really. Not really thinking about it. Astonishingly cavalier, astonishingly complacent. And we may well look at moments like that with something like horrified hindsight. If there are indeed uh, any of us left to look at it with horrified hindsight. Yes. This afternoon, Rishi Sunak responded to the warning from the experts. He said this, People will be concerned by the reports that AI poses an existential risk, like pandemics or nuclear wars. I want them to be reassured that the government is looking very carefully at this. Next week, Sunak is travelling to the US to meet President Biden and discuss AI risk. So we'll see what comes of that. Lastly on this, a sign that AI is not slowing down anytime soon. One of the companies that stands to gain the most from advances in AI is computer chip maker NVIDIA. It makes a particular kind of computer chip essential for AI applications. They have blasted past the $1 trillion market cap, joining an elite club of the most powerful and richest companies in the world. So the power of AI is growing, and so is the risk. This is, of course, a rapidly developing field, And I'm sure we'll be returning to the topic again in the near future if there are any of us left. And if you want to watch more from us on artificial intelligence, Aaron Bastani recently did a really great downstream podcast with Ian Hogarth. We'll put the link for that in the description box below as well. As we move ever closer to next year's election, we're going to hear a lot about not policy, but potential policy. The idea is to drop attractive-looking possible offers for select groups into the press so that it piques their interest. Suddenly, the theory goes, a party that 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 group would never have considered begins to look more interesting, even if it never takes the policy through to a manifesto. So is that what the Tories are now doing with millennials? So we've got Rishi Sunak urged to focus tax cuts on millennials. Interesting. The article goes on to say this, Bim Afalami, who represents Hitchin and Harpenton, said that graduates under the age of 40 should be paying a lower rate of tax as he insisted that younger voters were more concerned with the money in their pocket than with social issues. Speaking at an event held by Onward, the centre-right think tank, he said that millennials should suit the modern Conservative Party with a modern Conservative leader, especially Sunak. Afalami is proposing a pretty dramatic reorientation of the Conservative Party to capture millennial votes. And it's based on polling research conducted by the Tory think tank Onward. That report is called Missing Millennials. And in the foreword, Afalami says this. Put simply, millennials are critical of my party. Only 21% of them would vote Conservative today, and most think that we deserve to lose the next election. They do not currently believe that we are addressing their concerns and say they are lacking hope for the future. Many of the focus groups demonstrated a fatalistic approach to party politics. Their difficulty getting onto the housing ladder is a fundamental concern too, and the perception that we have failed to do enough on this has hurt the Conservative brand with these voters. 
trying to attract millennials. The largest generational cohort in the UK is, of course, a no-brainer. But is Afalami's research reliable? Let's take a closer look. First, it claims that those under 40 have a soft spot for the current prime minister, and that that could be electorally important. This graph is based on Onward's own research, and it seems to show that people think better of Sunak, the light blue line, than they do of the Tories, the dark blue line. But it's not very useful information. The dark blue line actually tracks people who intend to vote for the Tories, and that's a much stronger commitment than having a favourable view of Sunak, which isn't hard to do, given his predecessors. Afalami takes this big gap where the arrow is, a 25-point gap, to show that Sunak's popularity could create more Tory voters. But another way of reading that gap is showing that Sunak's favourability isn't converting into voting intention. In other words, the Tories are so toxic that even Robot Reliable can't convince millennials to vote for it. It's also worth pointing out that Starmer's favourability amongst millennials is pretty much the same as Sunak's. But the Labour Party does a lot better with them than the Tories do. The report also goes into where it thinks the millennials' policy interests lie. But is the research right about that? This graph shows what issues millennials, the orange rectangle, most care about when compared to what the average voter, the blue block, cares most about. The top three issues for millennials are the economy and the cost of living, the NHS and the environment. Those are exactly the same as for the average voter. What millennials next care about are housing and taxation, while immigration and crime come next for the average voter. Housing is a huge issue for millennials, an even bigger one for Gen Z, for obvious reasons, as the report notes. The aspirations of home ownership is falling further out of their reach. Only 8% of renting millennials say they don't want to own a home, but 45% do not expect they will be able to become homeowners in the next 5-10 to 10 years. And they are right. A third of those in their mid-30s to mid-40s are privately renting, up from 1 in 10 in 1997. But when it comes to taxation, things aren't so clear. According to the research, people between the ages of 30 and 44 are the most hostile to redistributive tax policies than any age group under 70. That's what the orange line is tracking. But they're also the most positive about big business among people under the age of 70. That's what the pink line is tracking. And you can see millennials there. They're the peaks on the left-hand side of the graph. Look, the report isn't very transparent about its methodology, and the phrase millennial covers a generational cohort that spans 20-odd years. So we can't be very sure about how reliable this data is on millennials' views on redistributive taxation. We shouldn't be surprised that people facing high rents and end a struggle to get on the housing ladder want tax cuts. But let's assume it is true. The problem for Lafalami is that his pitch for them takes the Tories back to the centre of politics. The report says as much here. Millennials are shy capitalists, which could give the Conservatives hope in the longer term. Similar to the Generation Z cohort, they emphasise policies that promote equality, but they are more like boomers in their pro-business and low-tax focus. If the centre-right can strike this balance, as it has done in the past, it may help build support for the Conservative Party. Economics are more important than cultural issues to millennials. Although this cohort leans left towards the soft left on the so-called culture war, they have low salience compared to other issues that will drive their voting intentions. Above all, millennials are optimists who are looking to the future. For politicians of any hue, they are seeking an aspirational offering that is future-facing and material to their lives at present. The Tories' opportunity for improving their stand with millennials is clear. They will need to be bold to win younger generations back. What the report is sketching out there is that the ground that Labour's Keir Starmer is already staking out, that, combined with a pledge to build more houses, mean that Starmer, not the Tories, has supposedly read the millennial mood, and with a 13-year record of austerity, economic mismanagement, and straight-up dishonesty behind them, it's going to be an extremely uphill task convincing large numbers of the most financially strained generation in recent history to put its faith in the party of economic irresponsibility. I don't think that millennials and Gen Z are necessarily super duper ideologically left wing, though I do think that feelings on certain issues, notably climate change, uh, LGBT rights, put them at odds with significant numbers of people who otherwise vote conservative or for right-leaning parties. So I think that this idea of generation left, um, a generation 
from the ages of 18 all the way up to 40 now who vote for the Labour Party, the Lib Dems, the Green Party, who want a more equitable economic settlement. I think that that's true, but is not necessarily rock solid. I think that a smart Conservative Party, which managed to do some very serious policy pivots, could be able to start breaking up that coalition that makes up Generation Left. So I think that the overall theory of the report, that's something I buy. It's something that I think the Labour Party, the Green Party, the Lib Dems all have to look out for, because if there's one thing we know about the Conservative Party, it's that they are the Great Reinvention Act. Like Madonna, they're able to totally rebrand themselves with each and every era to do something which seems totally at odds with the thing that came before it. Um, of course, you've got uh, this evolution into, you know, Johnsonian Brexit populism right after the uh, sort of, you know, managerial austerity techno technocracy of David Cameron. You've got Thatcher following hot on the heels of one nation conservatism. So anyone who thinks that the conservatives won't be able to transform themselves again in order to try and win over the next generation of voters, I think is really, really naive. They care about one thing and one thing only, and that is power. That is holding on to power because it is through dominating Westminster that they are best able to protect the interests of capital. That is the one rule of Conservative Party survival. It just so happens, though, that I think some of the things which are really necessary to win over millennials and Gen Z are things that the Conservative Party really don't want to do. They really don't want to do anything that brings down house prices, because that is something which massively impacts uh, their the core of their electoral support. The majority of people who own their own houses outright, i.e. without a mortgage, they mostly vote conservative. The conservative electoral bubble is kept afloat by rising asset prices. And so they're caught between a rock and a hard place, which is one of the reasons why they've been losing millennials and Gen Z. It's because of the skyrocketing cost of housing, the fact that buying a property is increasingly out of reach for young people. That property ownership amongst, uh, you know, 20 to 30 year olds has totally collapsed over the last 25 years. And that that's also having an impact on rent, that young people, because of the absence of council housing, because of mm -hmm. the absence of affordable homes for purchase, are flung onto the mercy of the private rental sector. And they're having, you know, upwards of a third, up to half of their incomes taken out of their pocket in the form of rent. I think that uh, their point about taxation is where they go, okay, so how can we, how can we be seen to put money in millennials' pockets? Well, there's a very good reason why lots of millennials are skeptical of higher taxes. It's not because they go, oh, I think that biz big businesses should be able to hoover up as much corporate profits as they want. Or, ah, I think oligarchs should be able to hoard their wealth to their heart's content. It's quite a material and realistic observation that where the tax burden is now, it is disproportionately focused on workers' incomes. And it is young people, younger people, who are feeling the brunt of that. So if you are a graduate employee and your earnings are £27,295, you will be paying a marginal tax rate of over 42%. Right, 42% marginal tax rate for somebody who is on just over £27,000. And that is because you're paying off your student loans. And so if you go to someone who is in that position, they are not income rich. They are already being taxed uh, pretty burdensomely and go, oh, do you want, do you want um, a tax cut? They'll go, of course I do. Right? Because that makes, that makes total economic sense. Of course they want a tax break. And I think that's a window of opportunity for the Conservatives. And it's not because they're going to deliver the best possible tax break to those graduate employees. It's because that provides some political cover to do the thing that they really want to do, which is cut taxes for corporations and the ultra wealthy. If what you wanted to do was to ease the burden on a graduate 
who is potentially facing upwards of £50,000 worth of debt that they've got to pay off, is potentially facing a marginal tax rate of 42%. Well, you'd scrap the tuition fees system. You'd write off student debt. You'd allow people to live freer, debt-liberated lives. But that's not something that the Conservatives are willing to do. For that matter, neither is Labour. I think that when it comes to the better poll ratings of the Labour Party or amongst millennials and, and Gen Z, it's because they are able to capitalize on the you know, decade and a bit's worth of policymaking disaster that's been shaped by successive conservative governments. But that is really something that's going to benefit you one time for one parliamentary term. If Kisama gets into power, but he doesn't really do anything on house prices, if he doesn't uphold his promises on council housing, if he doesn't do something big on student loans, if he doesn't bring down the cost of living by investing in public services and bringing down the costs of things like transport, he's going to end up, I think, with that same disillusionment, which is right now so frightening the Conservative Party. Because sure, Millennials aren't like homeowning baby boomer swing voters who could say, oh, well, if Labour doesn't do what I want, I can just go over to the Conservative Party. But millennials can do something which is electorally very meaningful. They can stay at home on general election day. We've got double trouble for you now because Tory MPs Jacob Reese mogg and Lee Anderson got together on GB News. It's not clear why specifically Anderson is appearing on Rees Mogg's show, but regardless, let's hear what the two Tory MPs said when discussing an uptick in shoplifting. Marks and Spencers is so worried that its stores will be filleted by criminals that there'll only be a rump of products left as thieves have such a neck that they try to outflank security guards as they purloin the sirloin and risk it with the brisket. A branch has resorted to placing just one steak on some of its shells to try to fend off thieves. Is the 23% increase in shoplifting down to the cost of living crisis, or is Britain really in the stew? Well, who better to have with me now than that son of Ashfield, Mr Lee Anderson? Lee, what are your thoughts on this? Do you think it is because of the cost of living crisis that that is forcing people to shoplift, and we ought to feel sorry for them and empathise uh, with the shoplifter? Well, you did forget there, Jacob, to say that some of these supermarkets are actually beefing up their security. I'm surprised uh, you missed that one. But no, I think this is a lot of nonsense about uh, it's a cost of living crisis. Look, there's always been shoplifting in this country. We know that. And, and some of the products that they are stealing, such as the beef um, joints and, and, and steaks and, and cheeses, we know where it goes. It's not going into their kitchen for these people to eat. This is going straight into the local Witherspoons. A lot of the time they're flogging it. Uh, and, and, and the local boozers are buying this or, or swapping it for drinks. It happens in my patch. I know it does. So it's just being sold on. Actually, Jacob, it, it's free market capitalism, except for the distributors are just stealing the products and moving it on. That's what it is. It's a quick money fix. And, you know, sometimes these people have got addictions or problems or whatever. But I blame a lot of this on, on, on some of the police forces in our country who are not clamping down on shoplifting. They're not seeing it as a serious crime. Shoplifting, I hope you caught this, shoplifting is almost free market capitalism. Not sure Lee's spotted how absolutely apt that comparison is. Uh, but seriously, shoplifting did go up by 23% in a year, the same year that saw inflation skyrocket, food prices soar, and energy costs spin out of control. But of course, for these members of the party that made it all happen, those two things can't be allowed to have anything to do with each other. It's much better to believe that criminality has spontaneously spread through communities than to worry about whether the people you made poor and hungry are prepared, to, are prepared now to break the law. Ash, is this a moral panic about shoplifting or is something more serious going on here? I think it can both be a moral panic about shoplifting and something more serious be going on underneath it. Because what you often find is that moral panics about street level criminality are often an expression of wider societal unease. It's like you can identify some of the symptoms, whether it's broken windows or a half price steak at your local pub, um, but you're unwilling to talk about the root causes. Because let's just think about it logically for a second. Whose preferred professional career is nicking steaks and trying to sell it 
to random publicans and punters. Absolutely nobody's, right? No one wakes up in the morning and goes, I want to do the most fulfilling and uh, lucrative and safe thing in the world that is stealing meat from M&S. Nobody does that. So the reasons why people do that are because in some other way, they've been driven to a point of desperation. Either they can't make money through legal means, or they've got substance abuse problems and are in real need of help, or they're reflecting a poverty and more specifically food poverty issue in their local communities, which is people want to consume these products, but the price that you pay in a shop are, is, is simply too expensive for them. So that's why it's cheaper to buy your baby formula from some random dude who's got it, you know, secreted in his coat uh, rather than buying it from Tesco's. So whatever way you slice it, this is something which is only happening. There's on the rise because you've got entrenched problems of marginalization of the uh, government, governmental level abandonment of whole communities and a rising tide of poverty. But that's nothing that the conservatives are willing to admit because then you'd have to go, well, why are people so poor? Why are people so desperate? Why are people with substance abuse issues so unsupported? Well, it's because of the policy that they've been in charge of since, you know, 2010. Um, and so that's why you have to make out to be, it is um, simply the result of failing to discipline the criminal scum enough. We've got an ever-growing prison population. That's actually something uh, which is you know, causing a crisis, which is that people are being banged up for offences. Uh, one of the reasons why you've got more people who are being incarcerated is because of the policy direction that the Conservatives have, impl have implemented, but it's also because people have to turn to crime because they don't have any other alternatives. It's because austerity, decades of neoliberalism, have cut the social fabric to pieces. But again, I always don't want to talk about that. Instead, what they want to talk about is how, you know, you need more uh, PC plods running around cracking heads. Otherwise, m and will never be able to, you know, safely administer its own meat aisle ever again. Heaven forbid. Um, thanks, Ash, for joining me tonight. Thank you for my Navarra debut. Oh, you smashed it, mate. Um, I... Can't wait to see you back in Michael Walker's chair. Hopefully it will happen soon. And hopefully next time I won't be being bitten by a mosquito, which has somehow made it into the room uh, and I've not been able to um, crush to death when the camera's on you. And thank you to everyone for tuning in. The show will be back tomorrow once again at 6pm with Aaron Bastani back in the hosting seat. For now, you've been watching Navarra Media. Good night. <laughs>